Okay, if we could turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation and chapter 15, please. Revelation chapter 15, relatively short chapter and yet full of marvelous truths. I'm going to read the, the entire chapter, verses 1 through 8, and we're going to be looking at the Song of Moses and the Lamb. So it begins this way in verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. And again, God always blesses the reading of his precious word. So this Song of Moses and the Lamb is really the prelude to the final judgments. It's kind of setting the scene for the final outpouring of the seven last plagues. Of course, it's closely connected with chapter 16, where we have the seven bold judgments that will be poured out. Now, I want to just give you an outline. It's not unique to me, and uh, I find it very clear, very helpful. And so in verse 1, we have a sign in heaven. And then in verse 2, we have a sea in heaven, (laughs) this uh, sea of glass. And then in verse 3 and 4, we have a song in heaven. And then in verses 5 through 8, we have a sanctuary in heaven where it talks about the temple uh, of the tabernacle of the testimony. So very simple outline, and we'll work through it uh, very carefully as we go through. We said that 15 and 16 chapters are very closely related. They both deal with the seven last plagues of God's wrath. This chapter is what we would say preparatory. And interpretive is telling us the reasons behind what's about to happen. And then the other is interpretive. It's going to actually interpret what these seven last plagues are about. And what we're going to find is this prelude is just telling us simply this, that the wicked world is about to drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which was seen and referred to in chapter 14. Uh, in we said in verse 10, it says the same shall drink of the wine, the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture unto the cup of his indignation. And he shall uh, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. So this is kind of the prelude to this outpouring of this cup of the the wrath of God. Also, just good to remind ourselves that this is the third in this and the final series of judgments, the prelude to this third and final series of judgments upon the earth prior to the personal return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. And so up to now, we've seen these three series of judgments. We've been walking through them and and we've seen how interconnected they are. When we had the seven seals, out of the seventh seal came the seven trumpets. And then uh, now we've the last trumpet is about to be sounded, and out of that will come 
the seven bowls. Yeah, and so this is, as we say, the prelude to, to this pouring out of the seven bowl judgments. I want us to notice, too, the connection between chapter 11. And it's good to just go back there for a moment, and we'll see verses 15 through 19. We've kind of had uh, what we kind of an interlude uh, we've we've had this kind of parenth parenthetical section in 12, 13, and 14, and now we're about to kind of resume the action. And so it's good to kind of go back and see where we left off uh, before this kind of interlude. And so as we go back to chapter 11 and verse 15, notice this. It says, the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. He shall reign forever and ever. The four and twenty elders which sat before God in their seats fell on their faces, worshipped God, saying, we give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come. And the time of the dead that they should be judged and that they should give reward to thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And now notice particularly verse 19, and the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in the temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquakes and great hail, the blowing of the seventh trumpet. There's kind of this anticipation now. Christ is about to come and reign, having poured out these last judgments, about to come and reign, and the temple of God was opened. And that's the connection that we're going to see when we get to our chapter, uh, this passage, chapter 15, about the, the temple being opened. You see, because again, uh, we notice in verse 5, linking chapter 11 to chapter 15, and after that, I looked and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. So it's kind of picking up the scene, as it were, and showing the connection. So one of the things that we've mentioned, too, is that these series of judgments, the seals, trumpets, bowls, that each series increases in intensity. We saw by the end of chapter nine, the world population had been reduced by 50 percent and now this final series of judgments are going to be the most severe and most intent intense because in them it is going to be the fierceness of the wrath of god filled up and so quite clearly this is going to be a very intense period of judgment and kind of the most intense it's kind of been building slowly and now it's going to reach its final crescendo. So we begin with this sign in heaven. It says, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. So this final sign relates to the preceding signs, right? That we've seen signs before. We saw one in chapter 12. In fact, we saw two signs in chapter 12. There appeared, verse 1, a great wonder, or same word, sign in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon, and under her feet, upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. Picture of the nation of Israel. That was the first sign, the nation of Israel. Second sign was the red dragon, verse 3, and there appeared another wonder in heaven. That's, again, that word sign, uh, same word. Another wonder in heaven, behold, a great red dragon having seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns upon his heads. So we got this idea of two signs so far. We've got Israel and we've got Satan. And of course, there's this war, isn't there? Satan wanting to destroy Israel, discredit Israel, uh, somehow eliminate Israel. Part of it. It's always been his goal, part of it, because they are their existence is proof of the existence of God. We said that the very... E-L on the end is, is proof of the existence of Elohim. And now we have this, this next sign, the third sign, which is great, he says, and marvelous. And it's these seven angels with the seven last plagues. And again, it's going to, in a sense, uh, do a great work. Uh, both in, in destroying and disrupting Satan's purposes and also in Israel's 
purposes. It's <laughs> going to be a purification of them. It's Remember, it's the day of Jacob's trouble. It's kind of yeah, two-thirds of them are going to be destroyed. A third of them are going to be saved. It's part, part of it is connected with Israel as well. And so these seven angels, they should not be confused with the two groups of three angels we saw in the previous chapter. Uh, they're completely different. Um, uh, or different to any previous groups of angels. There, these seven angels are the ones that are being given the responsibility, as it were, of pouring out these seven last bowls. So, what's the idea of this idea of seven last plagues? Just interesting when you go back to the book of Leviticus, and we'll just take a minute to do that. Just look at one verse in Leviticus chapter twenty-six. And verse 21, Leviticus 26, verse 21, read this scripture. It says, and if you walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. And so in a very real sense, these seven last plagues are God's judgment on a disobedient and contrary world. <laughs> God is about to, as it were, deal with a world that has been contrary and disobedient and rebellious towards him. And it's kind of reached its peak now. And God is about to pour out these seven last plagues. Of course, the word plague in scripture is used to describe direct divine action on sin or sinners. And it's already been used uh, in twice in the book of revelation to describe the previous judgments if we look back at chapter 9 and verse 20 chapter 9 verse 20 where we read and the rest of the men were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood which neither can see nor hear nor walk so it was used in chapter 9, verse 20 of the judgments that what we call the trumpet judgments. And then in chapter 11 and verse 6, these, it says, have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over earth, uh, uh, sorry, over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And so again, used of the the two witnesses and their ability to inflict plagues from God upon people who were still rebellious and refusing to repent. But now we have this idea of the seven last plagues. Now, again, just interesting to remind ourselves that this very word plague, you can't think of that word without, as it were, being reminded of a previous time in history, and that is the plagues of Egypt. The ten plagues that God brought on Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt. But now, a far greater tyrant. One who, in a sense, Pharaoh was a type, a picture, is about to be dealt with. And God is going to pour out these seven last plagues on particularly the beast and his kingdom and those that follow him and have embraced his ideology. They are going to suffer just as the Egyptians suffered tremendously because of their connection with a proud, arrogant ruler. They're called the last plagues because they're last, uh, the last of a series in the sequence of the seven seals, seven trumpets. No others are to follow. No more will be needed. It, it, it's really simple that this is, uh, the explanation is this, for in them, is filled up the wrath of God. There's no more after this. This is the fulfillment, the filling up of the wrath of God. And he says, these plagues, he describes them. I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. He talks about not just great, and great's going to be a, a description we're going to see a lot of in the next few chapters. It's going to be a lot of great things going to be occurring. Uh, the, word, the word great is going to be used kind of very frequently. Uh, but here, it, the the added uh, adjective is marvelous, great and marvelous. 
And the idea is this, that these plagues are going to cause people to absolutely marvel. They're, they're going to be cause awe and amazement. And yet, tragically, they will not cause repentance. They will cause awe. They will cause amazement, but they will not produce re repentance. And we're going to see that as we proceed. But they are certainly awesome as well as final in character, causing people to marvel. We said in these plagues is filled up the wrath of God. And we said that this word wrath, it's a very unusual word. It's used frequently in Revelation. And it's not the usual word, which is we've said God settled hatred against sin. But this is much more volatile, more passionate. This is this is a very passionate anger here uh, that is being described. Uh, and so it's where God's anger flashes hot. I think that's the best way of describing it. And we said that uh, of its use of God in the New Testament, of the of the 11 times that it's used in the New Testament, 10 of them are here in the book of Revelation. And so this is this is the time frame when God's anger flashes very hot. Now, you're all probably wondering, well, where else is it used in the New Testament in connection with God's uh, fiery, hot wrath? It's used in Romans 2. In Romans chapter 2, where uh, we read this very simple statement, Romans 2 and verse 8, it says... <clears throat> But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation. And that's the that's the word there, fiery wrath, uh, indignation and wrath. That's the other word, settled hatred. God settled continuous hatred against sin. And so this fiery wrath. So it's used of God there. But the rest of the re re references uh, to this hot, volatile, passionate anger are all found in the book of revelation and um, we, we 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 could take the time i guess we it won't take us it won't harm uh, but just to, to mention them uh, chapter 14 verse 8 is where it begins where we read there followed another angel saying babylon has fallen and is fallen that great city because they made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and so, again, it's kind of used in connection with Babylon there. But 10, it says, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. There's God's fiery response. Uh, verse 19, and the angel thrust in his sickle onto the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it onto the great winepress of the wrath of God, the, the hot, fiery anger of God. Here in 15.1, filled up the wrath of God. 15.7, one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Uh, chapter 16 and verse 1. It says, I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your way and pour out the vials or the bowls of the wrath of God, the fiery wrath of God upon the earth. Chapter 19. Sorry, 16, 19. 16 verse 19 and the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nation fell and great babylon came in remembrance before god to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his hot fiery wrath and then chapter 18 and verse 3 all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, the kings of the earth, and so on and so forth. Again, speaking of Babylon here, 1915, where we read, And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. He treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So you can see that uh, when we get to the book of Revelation, man's rebellion as it were, reaches its pinnacle. And as a result of man's rebellion reaching its pinnacle, God's fiery wrath begins to blaze against the human race. His anger flashes hot against the human race. And so, it's the book of Revelation, a book that reveals the judgment of God upon a Jesus Christ rejecting world and it says that it's filled up it's complete that's the idea it's reached an end or a name 
Yeah, his hot wrath is fulfilling an eternal purpose. God is not just blowing off steam, but there's a purpose in this, and he's about to fulfill it. Filled up, uh, translated by the revised version of finished. Uh, Darby says, is completed. It implies not merely a cessation, but has the idea of a conclusion arrived at, a goal reached. It implies God's purpose of the judgment has been accomplished. Tragically, the seven last plagues do not result, even though they're completed, they do not result in repentance. In fact, the result is given to us in verse 21 of chapter 16. There fell upon men great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. And so isn't it tragic that this this wrath of God, this final consuming wrath of God poured out, does not produce repentance at all. But it actually causes them to blaspheme like the beast who has been blaspheming God. These followers of the beast follow his example. And as a result of these plagues, they also blaspheme uh, the very God of heaven, the one who is pouring out these judgments upon them. Of course, the culmination of the judgment, as we saw earlier, is Revelation 19, where the final stage of the winepress of the wrath of God will be executed by the Lord Jesus coming from heaven after the seven last plagues. He comes and puts down all rebellion finally. And so the final stage of the wrath of God will be executed, as we saw in Revelation 14, verse 19, by the Lord Jesus himself when he comes to gather out the chaff, as it were. So we've seen the sign in heaven. Now we see the sea in heaven. Verse 2, I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, them that gotten the victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Again, we've said that um, the the architecture of heaven, it's it the tabernacle and the temple on earth were modeled on the heavenly sanctuary. And so part of the tabernacle on earth, there is what we call the, the the brazen sea or the uh <clears throat> the the um uh the laver uh, remember the priest when he came in he had to wash his hands and his feet uh at the laver so this is uh, another aspect of tabernacle furniture found in heaven uh, the sea of glass a physical representation uh of what we call the laver. And of course, the laver often represents the idea, at least in spiritual application, as the word of God, right? The cleansing effect of the word of God. How shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to thy word? And so the idea of cleansing uh, is through through the word of God. The uh, husbands love your wives. And how do you, part of you doing that is using the washing of the water of the word, just as Christ does that with us, using God's word, it's cleansing effect. And so some have suggested that the picture here is this, that these that are standing on the sea of glass, the reason they're standing on the sea of glass is because that when they were on earth before their martyrdom, they were standing on the word of God. <laughs> they stood firm on God's word, and now they're standing on the sea of glass. How important it is, by the way, and especially in a time of tremendous deception. Remember, uh, these are tribulation martyrs. When the lie and the, the, the deception is at its absolute pinnacle, and yet in this time of great deception, here's a group of people who stood firmly on the word of God. And now they're in heaven, standing on the sea of glass. And by the way, isn't it a great encouragement to us in our day, when there is much deception, to stand firmly on the word of God? Uh, it's really important. And so they're standing on the word. And again, because the tabernacle was a shadow of the reality of heaven, 
Uh, Hebrews 8 and 9 tell us this, a shadow of things in heaven. The sea of glass is actually a glassy sea of literal water of which the laver in the temple was but a picture. And again, let's just look at a couple of references to this laver, both in the tabernacle and the temple, Exodus 30 and verse 18. Exodus 30, verse 18, uh, we read this. It says, Thou shalt also make a labor of brass, and his foot also of brass, to wash with all, and thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation of the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. And then in First Kings, when the uh, temple of Solomon was being constructed, again, part of that construction included a labor Chapter 7, verse 23, it says, And he made a molten sea, ten cubits from the one brim to the other, was round all about, and his height was five cubits, and a line of thirty cubits did compass it round about. Really excited about the upcoming tabernacle meetings that we have coming up in our assembly, not this weekend, but next weekend. And uh, it's interesting, the more you look at Scripture, the more you see this tabernacle pattern Coming throughout the word of God, it really is. And here, particularly here in Revelation, uh, so many of the heavenly scenes have tabernacle ideas connected with them. And so, of course, the, in the tabernacle, it was meant for the purification of the priests before entering into their ministry. And certainly these uh, tribulation saints have been purified. Uh, they're now entering into their final ministry in heaven, uh, having been purified. Also notice that um, John sees these uh, believers from the tribulation who have overcome the beast and his system. They had not defiled themselves by yielding to the beast, but as we said, they held fast to the word of God. Their people who, Revelation 12, 11 says, they love not their lives unto the death. Since they didn't cooperate with the satanic system, received the mark of the beast. They weren't able to buy or sell. They were totally dependent on the Lord for their daily bread. By the way, just imagine this. You know, when the, the Lord asked his disciples, uh, or the disciples asked the Lord, Lord teaches to pray, one of the aspects of the prayer that he taught them as a model prayer was, give us this day our daily bread. Can you imagine how much significance that will have in the tribulation period when if you refuse the mark of the beast, you will not be able to buy and sell? How are they going to get their daily bread? <laughs> they are going to be so dependent on the Lord, aren't they? And I would imagine that that prayer will take on usually new significance. They'll be saying, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. How are we going to survive? How are we going to get by? We said some of them were put in prison and some of them were slain. But all of them practiced faith and patience and they got the victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, over the number of his name. And they now stand on the sea of glass. They now stand in the incomparable holiness of heaven because of their loyalty to the Lord. We saw the sea of glass earlier in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 6, it says, Before the throne there was the sea of glass, like unto crystal. In the midst of the throne, round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. But now we see that the sea of glass is mingled with fire. Of course, it reminds us, doesn't it, that our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 29. Also, Hebrews 12, 29 as you'd imagine, Hebrews is quoting from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 4, verse 24, where it says, The Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. And so he's about to enter into severe judgment. Part of it is because of the treatment of his own. He takes it personally. Uh, remember when uh, Stephen was martyred? And the, the head in heaven <laughs> felt very clearly the suffering of the body on earth. And certainly uh, because of the suffering, uh, as it were, God's fiery anger is, 
uh, certainly brought out here because of the way that his people have been treated. But also tells us another little detail. They're standing on the sea of glass and it says they have the harps of God. <laughs> what that tells us is these people are victors, not victims. In fact, they've got a song. <laughs> we're going to learn about that song in a moment. But they were victors. Their death, they weren't hapless victims. They were victors. They were overcomers. They had gotten victory, it tells us, over the beast and over his image and over the number of his name. And I think it's really important to see this. It's interesting, too, isn't it, that the greatest victories always occur, it seems, through death. For instance, Samson's greatest victory was attained by his death. A far greater victory was accomplished through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. That death accomplished such marvelous, marvelous things, didn't it? And even for the believer, the believer enters into real victory when he dies to self and recognizes himself to be crucified with Christ. It's only then that we enjoy victory, isn't it? And, and so you can see that, in a sense, death is a victorious thing. It can either be through these martyrs who have laid down their lives all at once. They're, they're, they've got victory. But for us, we can do it incrementally every single day, dying to self, dying to the demands of the flesh, dying to the uh, the allurements of the world, seeing ourselves as dead with Christ, buried with Christ and risen with Christ. That is the pathway to victory. And of course, it says they have the harps of God indicating God has given them the ability to praise him. Despite all that they've gone through, despite the hardships, despite the the terrible uh, conditions that they found themselves in living in this last period of, in a sense, prior to the coming of Christ. And yet uh, they've got the hearts of God. And so they have a song. And of course, isn't it wonderful that for us, he put a new song in our hearts, even praise to our God. And by the way, it's a wonderful thing to sing God's praises, isn't it? And so they've got the harps of God. And it says they sing a song. Uh, they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Interesting that uh, we saw in chapter 14, and I wanted to, just to go back there and see the parallel here. Uh, these martyrs, uh, they're singing a song, and they're using harps to accompany their song. And in chapter 14 of Revelation, verse 13, Uh, no, verse three, verse three. So the 144,000, it says, they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song, but the 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth. And so again, there's, there's this new song that they're hearing here. And notice verse two, I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and the voice of a great thunder. And then he said this, I heard the voice of harpers harping their harps. I want you to get this. So the harpers are harping their harps in heaven. And John is hearing this from heaven with 144,000 who are on Mount Zion on the earth. And and we, we, we tried to make that connection before, but there, these 144,000, it seems like there's a direct connection between the throne of God in heaven, the throne of Lamb on the earth, and they can hear, as it were, this, this victory song from, the, from heaven. So the 144,000 on earth joined the company in heaven. Both of them have experienced victory, some through death and martyrdom, some the Lord preserved them, but they're able to sing together this song of victory uh, and there's a unity between heaven and earth in this song so what is this song well just as on the banks of the red sea israel sang in triumph the song of moses it takes us back doesn't it to exodus chapter 15 exodus chapter 15 
verse 1, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song to the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he hath thrown into the sea. And so just as, as at that time on the banks of the Red Sea, Israel sang in triumph the song of Moses, so the saints again will sing when an enemy mightier than Pharaoh is about to be thoroughly defeated. These are ones that overcame him by the by the blood of the lamb. So they sing the song of Moses and they sing the song of the lamb because they recognize that their victory, uh, like Moses' victory, it's, it's a work of God. It's a work of the lamb. And so they sing this great song when this enemy mightier than Pharaoh is defeated. Notice too, as we look at this song, how would they begin? They sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Of course, his works express his deity. And so in a very real sense, they, they can say this clearly is Lord God Almighty because of, of the works that he has done. And again, uh, great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Uh, I want to just go back to Psalm 139 for a minute, where we, we see how uh, these acts of God are clearly a reflection of his deity. Psalm 39, 14, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. And so there's this recognition of the divine greatness of God because of the works that he has done in redemption, in redeeming them, just as Israel had been redeemed from Egypt. Now these have been redeemed from, uh, from sin and from Satan and from the beast even. And they're singing this song of victory. And of course, it's directed to the Lord God Almighty. Interesting how, uh, according to Mr. Vine, Nine out of the ten references to Almighty are found in Revelation <laughs> because it's a, a revelation of the, the mightiness of God, he is, that he is Almighty. The only other reference is in 2 Corinthians 6, 18, where, uh, as we studied 2 Corinthians, we saw uh, that if we practice true separation, come out from among them, be separate, uh, that God will appear to us reveal himself to us and how will he do that second corinthians 6 18 where we read this it says verse 17 wherefore come out from among them be ye separate saith the lord and touch not the unclean thing i will receive you and will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters saith the lord almighty so that's the only other time in the new testament that this idea of the Lord Almighty is used. The rest of them are all in Revelation. Nine out of the ten references. Uh, so we're getting a, a now one time. Uh, we'll just see this in chapter nineteen. It's not just mentioned as Almighty. It's but it's the word omnipotent. But it's the same word in the Greek. Psalm uh, re, sorry, uh, Revelation nineteen verse fifteen and sixteen, where it says. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them. With a rod of iron he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Yeah, so it's Almighty there, so it must be a different reference. 21 verse 22 maybe is the one I'm thinking of, where it uses the word omnipotent. No, nope, it's Almighty there too. It's the one that says the Lord God omnipotent reigneth which I cannot put my finger on right now. So going back to our song, Revelation 15. The Lord God Almighty, and then it says, just and true are thy ways. Again, a reference back to Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, that God's dealings, even in judgment, are just and true. Uh, in other words, the world deserves this. It, justice is being meted out. Uh, and 
God is clearly acting according to the attribute of divine justice. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. Again, he is the rock. His work is perfect. All his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. And so again, they're emphasizing the fact that just and true are thy ways. So we're talking about God's works, now God's ways, just and true. It says, thou king of saints. Now it's interesting, it says king of saints. We, don't, we tend not to think of the king of saints. We tend to think of him as lord of saints, don't we? Rather than king of saints. But actually, again, it's a direct quotation from the Old Testament. And it's from Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 17. Jeremiah 10 sorry, verses six and seven, where it says, for as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might, who would not fear thee, O king of nations? For to thee doth it appertain, for as much as among all the wise men of the nations, and in all their kingdoms, there is none like unto thee. So really, it's used there, quotation from jeremiah 10 7, 6 and 7 where it's rendered king of nations and of course he's going to be seen not just as king of saints but as king of nations as well when he comes and reigns then he says this who shall not fear thee o lord and glorify thy name for thou only art holy for all nations shall come and worship before thee for thy judgments are made manifest so again, this song we've set, seen, it's deeply rooted in the Old Testament. It gives praise to God for his works. Great and mar marvelous are your works. His ways, just and true are your ways. His worthiness. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. And of course, an essential uniqueness that belongs to deity is that he alone is inherently holy. Uh, we can be made holy, we can become holy, but he, by very nature of his existence, uh, uniquely is holy. And so, and then, as well as God's worthiness, we have in this song, God's worship. All nations shall come and worship before thee. Of course, this is going to be fulfilled when Christ comes to reign and, uh, I just want to look at some of the, the abundant references to the idea of the fact that when the Lord comes to reign, that all nations will come before him and worship him. This, this idea of praise to God and universal worship is in keeping with many other scriptures and, of course, relates to the second coming of Christ and the worship of God by the entire world in the millennial kingdom. And so I want to just, just kind of run through some of these references. I find them very fascinating. And, again, these kind of things makes you, uh, can, uh, certainly for me, makes me very convinced that there has to be a future millennial period for these things to find their full fulfillment because uh, right now all nations are definitely not worshiping him there may be some from every tribe and tongue and people and nations but most nations are in full rebellion against him psalm 2 verse 8 and 9 ask of me and i will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession thou shalt break them with a rod of iron thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel Psalm 66, verses 1 through 4. Just some beautiful scriptures that speak of this coming day where universal worship will be brought to the Lord. Make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands. Sing forth the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say unto God, how terrible are thou in thy works. Through the greatness of thy power shall thine enemies submit themselves unto thee. All the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee, they shall sing unto thy name, Selah. Think about this. Psalm 72, verses 8 through 11. Psalm 72, verse 8. 
He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him. His enemies shall lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of the isle shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. So again, just marvelous references. Psalm 86 and verse 9. It says, all nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. Book of Isaiah. And again, I, I hope you see the importance of doing something like this, this exercise of going through and just seeing that this has never happened in human history, but it's about to be fulfilled at the second advent of the Lord Jesus when he indeed reigns in splendor over the earth it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it many people shall go and say come ye let us go to the mountain of the lord uh, to the house of the god of jacob and he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths for out of zion shall go forth the law and the word of the lord from jerusalem and he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people they shall beat their swords into plowshares their spears into pruning hooks nation shall not lift up sword against nation neither shall they learn war anymore isaiah chapter 9 again one that we know very well verses 6 and 7 isaiah 9 6 and 7 it says for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be on his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. On the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Isaiah 66 Isaiah 66, <clears throat> verse 18. For I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. I will set a sign among them, and I will send them that escape of them unto the nations, to Tarshish, Paul, and Lud, that draw the bow, to Tubal and Javan, to the isles afar off, that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory. And they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. They shall bring all your brethren for an offering to the Lord out of all the nations upon horses and in chariots and in litters and upon mules and upon swift beasts to my holy mountain Jerusalem, saith the Lord, as the children of Israel being an offering in a clean vessel unto the house of the Lord. And so again, just seeing what God intends to do. Uh, verse 23 shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And we could go on uh, references in Jeremiah, Zephaniah, Zechariah. But what we're seeing is this, that there's a coming day, just as it says in this marvelous song of Moses and the Lamb, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, and thy judgments are made manifest. Now, before we leave this song, I want to do one more thing, which I think is really important. I want you to notice the emphasis in this song. And I want you just to notice the pronouns. So it says, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the Lamb saying, great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name, for thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Do you get the thought here? These martyrs singing are only focused on God. They didn't focus on their own costly and glorious victory. They have the heart of true worship. They understand that it's all about God and not about us. And I, I think it's interesting 
and, and what a what a contrast, by the way, to much of contemporary Christian songs. Much of contemporary Christian songs, it's all about me. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do this, and 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 it's all egocentric. Yet genuine worship is not egocentric. It's God-centered. It's Christ-centered. And you can see it here so beautifully, can't you, that, that their song, they're just taken up with, with the Lord, with his works and his ways and his worship and his worthiness. And what a lesson for us. Oh, Lord, deliver us from being taken up with ourselves. Help us to enter into that place of true worship where, where we're just consumed with you and what you've done and who you are. So verse 5, after that, I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened, and the seven angels came out of the temple having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, having their breasts girded with golden girdles, one of the four beasts gave unto them seven angels, seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from the power, from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Now we get this link with chapter 11, verse 19. The door to the temple in heaven is again opened, as we saw in eleven nineteen. The seven angels come out dressed in white, again, showing kind of this judgment is righteous, and gold, as it were, girdles, golden girdles, they come out of the temple. Now, the golden girdles, interesting that a girdle is usually goes around the waist, right? You remember, it says, gird up the loins of your mind, and the idea was this, that they would, they would tuck their flowing robes in their belt so that they could, they could then... Uh, run freely and move freely but here the girdle is around the breasts and what's the point here you it, it, the idea is this the breasts usually speak of human affection and the idea is this that human sin has reached such a peak that all affection is restrained these judgments are poured out we saw without mixture there's there's, there's not any affection left here now because human sin has reached such a peak. In a dignified manner, one of the living creatures gives a bowl to each of the seven messengers. The bowls are vessels that are used in temple ministry. Uh, remember, the, the incense uh, was in the bowls uh, that was uh, brought before God earlier in chapter 8. And so... Uh, the idea that they were they were used specifically in connection with the temple, and so but now these bowls, no longer with incense, uh, <clears throat> but instead, uh, sorry, look, look at Revelation five eight just to see what I'm saying here. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials or golden bowls full of odors which are the prayers of saints. So they were used, as it were, for with incense. Uh, and of course, all was connected with the temp temple, these golden bowls. But now, perhaps part of the prayer of the martyrs that was brought before God is about to be in uh, answered. And these are now filled with smoke from the, from the, uh, of God's fury and God's wrath, from the, the vessels that are full of the wrath of God. Then it says, the temple was filled with smoke. And the idea is this, just as remember when the tabernacle was set up in Exodus 40, or the, the temple was dedicated in 1 Kings 8 and 10 and 11, it says that, that both the tabernacle and the temple were filled with the glory of God so that no one could enter in. And here's a simple picture. God's awesome glory once again, fills this temple in heaven with his, we often call it the Shekinah glory. And what that means is it prohibits anyone from entering in. Nobody at this late stage can enter in to intercede. 
Notice verse 8, temples filled with smoke from the glory of God, from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. And so what it means is this, there's nobody at this stage can step in and intercede. It's too late. It's too late. Until the seven plagues of the seven angels are fulfilled, there's no possibility of intercession. And so what a what an amazing uh, little chapter. It's, as it were, a prelude. It's setting the scene for the final judgments. And what it's telling us is, it's too late now. There's no possibility of intercession, no possibility of stopping. Judgment is about to fall, these seven last plagues. But we'll have to wait, Lord willing, till next week, until we witness the seven last plagues poured out on the earth. In the meantime, I hope that we're filled with song and our song is christ-centered and god-centered rather than self-centered to his glory amen